Hello, welcome to the DeviantArt Podcast. My name is Matt Buholtz. You may know me as Gigi Matt B. And we're very excited to have DeviantArt's 20th birthday today that we're celebrating. Now, to make that even more exciting, we've got a super, super special guest. We've got Loish, who we're going to join in right now. Hey, I made it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let me adjust Whoa, my Whoa, my camera. heart is beating so fast. I was so worried that that wasn't going to work out. <laughs> oh, it's all right. Technology and live streams in general are super exciting. And I see that a bunch of your followers are popping in right now in the chat. If you want to say hi to them. I know you don't yeah. do a ton of live streams, but yeah, give them a welcome. Hi, everybody. Oh, I saw all of your messages. Somebody said, it's going to work. Don't worry. I'm not really. <laughs> like that helped a lot <laughs> it, it always ends up working in the end live streams are always yeah. one of those challenges where something inevitably goes wrong and you just kind of yeah. get used to it <laughs> but we've got oh. you in now so do you guys have the same view as me with like uh like cropped above and below my head yeah you're, you're framed okay. really well so and you we guys are not foliage. gonna see here look i put oh! up some <laughs> I love it. I love happy it. birthday deviant art oh <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. And I got a balloon over here too that oh. I can wave around spontaneously when the question is, you know, when I need a moment to think. Yeah, it's, it's a good delay. I've got one that I can blow up here. So, <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. It's so exciting to have you on. I'm very stoked. And on the 20th birthday of a website, which doesn't happen that frequently for any website. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, especially a website. I mean, I think that there are probably a lot of websites out there that have their 20 year, uh, 20 year birthday, but whether they're still relevant is sort of like the question. And I think DeviantArt still has a lot of users is still super active. I mean, you guys survived MySpace, you know, that already Exactly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I would like to start things off by going way back in the day and just talking about uh, you getting started on DeviantArt, like, do you remember what your first artwork was that you posted there? Oh, God, no, I don't remember which exact <laughs> art piece, but I do remember that, like, I, um, I was like, I didn't know how the site worked. And I was just like, I'm going to upload everything that I have. So I mm -hmm. uploaded like, I think, 50 or 60 drawings in one day <laughs> and completely flooded the front page, you know, with all of my uh, little pixelated drawings. Mm -hmm. So that was like, I think that the first art that I posted was just, I mean, I was spamming it. So yeah, <laughs> I remember that day. I was it's like, I guess I'll just put everything I ever made on here. Why not? You know? <laughs> yeah, you always want to have that like portfolio feel when you first start a new page on anything exactly. <laughs> you're like I've been here for a minute yeah <laughs> just trying everything out in one exactly <laughs> exactly uh do you remember who like some of the first people you chatted with on DeviantArt were like some of the first so, friends you made there I was thinking about that because like the fact that it's the 20 you know the 20th birthday made me a bit nostalgic thinking back on like all the deviant art memories and mm -hmm. I remember that my first like um deviant art follower that was like frequently returning you know always coming back and commenting and consistently commented for a really long time was uh a user called xeno christ so it was like mm -hmm. x x xeno and then c r y s t and that 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 person i think his name is ryan he was like always he was the first little like username icon that i always saw coming back again and again and i think he was like my first loyal follower that's and so that, cool <laughs> yeah that meant so much to me because i was just posting amateuristic junk you know i mean it meant so much he saw potential in me where others didn't and it was really cool of him it, it's always nice when whether you're getting started or even when you're established having those names that you can kind of look back on and be like i like you've been here for like a, a minute and you've always supported yeah. me like it's so nice yeah. to have those people it is and you never forget them i mean i never forget them exactly uh do you remember like kind of the early days of DeviantArt like take us back you wrote like a very nice journal today about all of your experiences I was reading yeah. it while walking my dog I <laughs> <laughs> I remember oh I remember it so well because I remember like in the early days of DeviantArt and this is like early days of internet almost kind of stuff um you you could like go to the front page and just see recently uploaded stuff and you could mm -hmm. see the stuff that had been uploaded in the last like couple of days whereas now if you look at recently uploaded content it's 
it's too much. Too much is being uploaded on any platform at any given moment. You know, you can't yeah. keep up. And most of it is spam. But in those early DeviantArt days, you could just go to like the recently uploaded stuff and just kind of look through what people have been doing and discover a lot of new art. I discovered a lot of new art that way. So mm -hmm. I would see something recently uploaded and I would be like, oh, um, I'll just leave a message saying how cool I think this is. And they'd still be online because they just uploaded it, you know? So it was like instant, yeah. instant connecting with people. Um, there was like daily top favorites, I remember, like mm -hmm. stuff that got the most favorites got on the front page. Um, it was so, it was like, a bustling and large yet intimate community. It was really special. Yeah, it's, it's kind of unique because I think it does have a space where people want to talk about art, which is kind of special. Yeah. Uh, and I loved seeing that always, whenever I'd post a piece and someone would say like, oh, I like, like your line weight or whatever, like something that I'd purposefully been focusing on, I'd be like, yes, this yeah. is perfect. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, DeviantArt was like a place where people would notice because people would follow each other and it had like, you know, now you get a lot of artists complaining that there's the, the timelines aren't chronological. Mm -hmm. But on DeviantArt, you could see everything that, that had been uploaded by one user, you know, like you couldn't just like, you didn't miss posts because you logged in a day too late. You could catch up on everything at a later yeah. point. And um, people would notice if you improved. So I always like whenever I put a piece on there that I spent like extra time on, put did, did like really tried my best. People would be like, "Wow, I can see that you tried your best." And I would be like, "Oh, did you see it?" <laughs> you know. Whereas now it's like I get a lot of comments that are like, "Oh, I haven't seen your post in like a month. What's going on?" And it's because the algorithm yeah. is so unpredictable. Mm -hmm. It can be a real challenge on platforms where you don't get to see that. Like I always enjoy getting to you know, kind of see what I expect to see when I want to see. And yeah. one of the challenges is, like you said, there's so many people on the internet, especially artists nowadays, that post that it's hard to keep up with everything. Yeah, it <laughs> is. And now you can miss stuff, you know? Yeah. If you're not on every day, you miss it. Whereas on DeviantArt, I used to just wait until I had time, and then I would catch up on everything. And yeah. that's something that, like, you can't do anymore. It's, like, unfathomable, you know? <laughs> yeah, Fr Fridays are my clear out my watch list days where I go yeah. through everyone. <laughs> I'm like, oh, here's yeah. what people did this week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's always fun also to see people's journals from, like, mm -hmm. you know, if you missed out, you can catch up on what they wrote last month or whatever. That's It's really yeah. unique. It's sort of like how things used to be on the Internet. And I think on DeviantArt, it's still an option. It's still there. And it's been sort of, like, streamlined to like a more contemporary look and feel, but it still has that uh, unchronological timeline, which is just yeah. it's really good. It's really it, good, especially if you have your favorite artist or you want to know what they're up to. It's always happy to have those options, you know? Yeah. Like, wow. exactly. <laughs> uh, so something really exciting about DeviantArt and our birthday today is you were a huge part of DeviantArt for us, and we want to have you be a part of our 20th birthday. So we're running that recreate it in your style challenge. Yes. Which is super cool. Like if you guys haven't seen the piece yet, please check it out. There'll be a link in our bio and Lois has posted it everywhere and it's on our mm -hmm. socials. And uh, it's kind of like a draw this in your style, but we're calling it recreate this in your style because if you want to write a piece inspired by it, if you want to make balloon art <laughs> of the character, yeah. you have all these options because DeviantArt isn't always just about like, drawing it's about you know written art or music art or whatever sort of way that you want to express yourself but i would love to hear a little bit about what went into making that piece for you um so i i love draw this in your style challenges so i've been going around on instagram for a while and every now mm -hmm. and then i've used that as a sort of like starting point for drawing something because i really love um just translating something into like the process of taking something and then translating it into your own style. I've actually been doing that for a really long time with like Disney fan art and stuff, you know, just taking mm -hmm. the design and seeing like, how would I make this? Um, and to draw this in your style, I think super fun challenge. I've also done one myself that other people could draw in their style. And for this mm -hmm. challenge, I think it's really cool that it gets elevated to like recreate it in your own style because DeviantArt indeed has so many different types of artists. I remember that DeviantArt started as like skin design. Yeah, which a, a Winamp skin site. Right. Uh, I think I got some Winamp skins <laughs> from there because I was like into that stuff, like customizing yeah. to the max. Um, 
and then like there are pixel artists, there are like doll artists, there are writers, mm -hmm. there there's all kinds of artists there. And um and I've always experienced the site that way. Um and, and I've often had like when I I've I've gotten comments that are like, Hey, this painting inspired me to write a short little story, for example. And this yeah. month, they post that on DeviantArt. Uh -huh. And so having a recreate this in your own style is really cool because I kind of next level that uh, all sorts of different kind of creators can be involved. Yeah, it's it's one of those really fun times to like you said, see how how pieces can inspire people and how art can inspire people across yeah. everything. I love the chat right now. People are like, what's Winamp? Winamp, they're, they're, gosh, they're, they're we should tell confused. them. Yeah. We should tell uh, them. Okay, so Winamp was like just, it's like a way <laughs> of playing music, but it was like before streaming and Spotify. So you just downloaded, mm -hmm. oh, downloading was not allowed. But I did yeah. that. <laughs> downloaded uh, music. It took and one then, night to download a single song. Yeah, that's supposed to forever. Sometimes it took like a really long time. And also it took a lot of spyware on your computer, depending on which yeah. software you use. Um, and then you would like play in a little app and that app was like 100% customizable. You can make the most yeah. insane skins. Like they would make like these super futuristic, like chunky techie skins with mm -hmm. the play buttons all like in super creative spots. That was that was when yeah. it was before Spotify. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I guess it was that it was Spotify or iTunes for a generation past. Oh, yeah. <laughs> iTunes kind of skipped me because I've never been an Apple user. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wasn't until DA. <laughs> yeah. but, Somebody but, said Kazaa days. That, that's uh, yeah. what I use. Kaza, I use <laughs> Morpheus, LimeWire. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> Napster. <laughs> uh, yeah, all of the fun ones. <laughs> oh, we're so old. <laughs> uh, but so is DeviantArt now. But yeah, still DeviantArt's kicking. getting so old. Oh my god, <laughs> growing up. <laughs> uh, so one thing that I'd like to mention too. Sorry to loop us back. Uh, I got distracted by Winamp and people not knowing what it was because <laughs> yeah. that blew my mind. Um, for recreate this in your style, like when you see those sort of challenges, like a draw this in your style challenge or a recreate this in your style challenge. What sort of pieces do you like seeing? Do you like when people are like trying to go directly for like a one-to-one -one, or do you like seeing the more kind of outside the box pieces? Like what inspires you when you see people creating off of them? I love it when people are very playful with their style and kind of push it, you know, mm -hmm. push it to, um, to be something. What, because what I think is always interesting about draw this in your style is that there's always a few people who make it really funny or really surreal or really super cartoony. So mm -hmm. I love it when people push it a little further into like making it a statement about not, not only their style, but the mood that they like to create with their creations. So that's what I like to see. Would, would you say that mood is embedded in style to get like a little bit deeper into art? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, it definitely is. I said, because a lot of the stuff in my style, like I always want to create like a sort of serene and, and dreamlike mood in my art. And I'm always mm -hmm. using stylistic elements that are lifted from like underwater imagery and like floating dreamlike imagery. So mm -hmm. I think that that definitely plays into, it's like interwoven in many ways. Yeah, definitely. Um, but again, check out the journal on DeviantArt, uh, DeviantArt.com slash team. Uh, and you can find a link in our bio and all over the place. Yeah, and also team. in my bio. Yeah, you just go head over there. Yeah, but start making some recreate this in your style. We'd love to see it. It's a fun way that you can celebrate uh, the birthday with us and uh, just be a part of things with us as we get real excited to be 20. Yeah. <laughs> um, On to so, the next 20. <laughs> oh my gosh, the next 20. What do you think the art scene will look like in 20 years? I think it's going to be all like VR kind of stuff. Yeah, a lot more yeah. experiential. Actually, I think we'll all be definitely like 100% hooked up to the Matrix <laughs> and just like <laughs> canned in, a, in this little pod and everything will just come straight from our minds. Yeah. I've... You heard it from me first. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll look back in 20 years from our pods and we'll be yeah. like, she was right. It <laughs> she... was Lois. She was the only person she, who came up she with that called concept. It. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting to see how much art has expanded in the past 20 years, too, because like when you look at art 20 years ago when like DA started, you would see so many more uh, like smaller communities around it. And now art seems to be everywhere, which is so exciting, but it's so much 
content in the same yeah. sense. It's uh, true. How much has your art and the way that you perceive art changed in the past 20 years? Um, well, it's been overwhelming to see just the sheer amount of art that's being created and the sheer amount of skill that exists. Mm -hmm. um, I, show, I, I love showing people my old art just for kicks because I think it's like really I, like I had no filter for like t what was tasteful and what was not. You know, I just mm -hmm. made whatever came to mind without thinking about it. Um, and I made a lot of like awkward and bad art when I was like 17 18 years old mm -hmm. and now when i look at 17 and 18 year olds they are like hyper talented you know compared to what i was like um back then so yeah <laughs> uh and that kind of like it's amazing to see there's a lot of inspiration but i sometimes worry like i guess it's that fits into my you know mm -hmm. now being a 34 year old like i look at young people and i think like are you guys okay Cause, like you should be allowed to you know mess up and, yeah and um, like the the degree of incredible talent that's expected of people is sometimes like so extreme. So I think that like I'm inspired as somebody watching it, consuming it, seeing it come in. It's mm -hmm. beautiful to see. But as somebody who has like experienced my artistic growth, you know, quite visibly online since, you know, since I was 16 or so, mm -hmm. I think it's like just such a hyper competitive environment, so much pressure to monetize, so much pressure to be super talented at a young age. Mm -hmm. That's something that I'd say is like, so I, I like it when the emphasis in these art communities are on like uh, playfulness, just messing around, like lightheartedness and mm -hmm. sharing our struggles with one another. I think that's healthier than like, you know, competing to be the best because it's impossible nowadays. It's just, it's not possible, it's too much. Yeah, uh, we've talked about that a little bit on our previous call where we were talking about like how the internet becomes almost a perfection machine yes. where you, you know your product and you start pushing that product and some people fall into the trap of only having one product. And there's so much more to art that can be experienced in exploration. Yes, exactly. Uh, exactly, you... and it... Yeah, go on. Oh, no, I was just going to say, how would you encourage people to find that sort of, like, exploration and adventure in their art? I think it's okay. Like, I think you have to give yourself permission to experiment. And I think it's really important to, like, I always try to tell people, like, I try to emphasize that I didn't have any idea about how I was going to build my career or, like, a future as an artist until you know fairly recently actually um i was just always kind of like well we'll see how it goes um and of course that's not like an approach that works for everybody but what's really important there is that um like things change too fast to know exactly how things are gonna go and mm -hmm. i didn't know that i could be a character designer for f just female characters for the most part when I graduated because there weren't that many like stories and games and stuff with female lead characters. And now mm -hmm. there are. So this is like a change that I couldn't have known was coming, but it worked for me because I kept doing what I truly loved. So I always try to tell people like, keep drawing, even though there's pressures on you to make money or to do, you know, school assignments or whatever, you have to keep doing what you love on the side because who knows what could grow from that. You know, you have to keep doing, uh, I, t I always say, uh, keep calm and never ignore your guilty pleasure. <laughs> like never, because uh, you never know what can grow out of it. And it's really important to have like an area like a, of your art practice that is purely guilty pleasure. And I've, I've always been kind of like, you know, I've always had people say like, well, Lois, you're really, you know, you're talented, but you draw like, you know, really girly stuff. <laughs> and And they thought it was like sort of, you know, corny. A lot of my teachers uh -huh. and classmates were like, oh, it's really pink and blue. And they just <laughs> didn't like that stuff, you know, and that's okay. Uh -huh. But like, if I had kind of thought like, oh, I shouldn't make this because people think it's corny, then I wouldn't have had the life that I have now because I now ha uh, work with people and have followers that do appreciate that. Yeah. So so I always tell people, like, know what your guilty pleasure is, like what you like. And no matter how corny it is or in poor taste or your art teachers don't like it, you have to hold on to it because something can always grow from there. Yeah, I, th I think that's really wise. And indulging in those guilty pleasures, as you call them, like uh, there, there's so much about that that does define your style and like your voice as an artist. 
Like, yeah. even if that's not what you're producing, that's something within you that you enjoy. And exactly. to be able to express that joy through art is something essential. Yeah. And I think that that's what people are truly responsive to. Like in art, people respond to uh, if they can see in your art that you are enjoying it, that you're like mm -hmm. really into it, vibing with it. That's that has a more of an impact than if you simply have skills in an area that is maybe not like fully your passion. Yeah. Uh, we do have a question from chat that is kind of along these lines that says, how do you manage to do things for yourself in free time after work with and avoid burnout? Because when work is the same as your hobby, it's difficult from April sketches. So I'm assuming this is someone who's an artist for their job, but also yeah. wants to continue to make personal projects. Yeah, that's, that's a tough one because like, no matter how much advice I can give on doing what you truly love, it all depends on how, like how much privilege do you have to pursue that? You know, not everybody mm -hmm. has the same amount of time. Um, I, I, there's a lot of people in my Facebook group, for example, that say like, well, I'm a stay at home mom. Like I don't have time because I'm always taking care of my kids. And when I, mm -hmm. when they're asleep, I fall asleep too. So there's like all these different situations where it's really rough. It's hard to do that. And I think you always have to set priorities and having your financial situation in order is often the highest priority, understandably so. Um, me personally, I, uh, approach it, but I had a phase where I was feeling that way, like super burned out from all the client work and not getting enough time for my own creative passion. Mm -hmm. And I decided to set up a Patreon to solve that. Um, and my Patreon is now like sort of the time that I set aside for my own, um, art. Uh, if you don't have options like that, then, you know, I'd say sh very short drawing sessions can have a huge impact. So you really don't have to draw for like hours on end and make super detailed and beautiful pieces in order to get your creativity flowing. You could draw for like just 15 minutes a day or, you know, uh, longer sessions, but then twice a week, like as long as it's regular, it, it can have a huge impact. Um, and, and I'd say like, just try to look for ways that you can prioritize that. Even if that means just browsing inspiring art when you're lying on the couch at the end of the day that you like and putting it in a Pinterest for later when you do have time. Like mm -hmm. anything you can get, try, try, to, try to get that. But not everybody can and that's okay too. Like don't feel bad if you don't mm -hmm. have that time. Totally. Um, so you mentioned a little bit in there, a lot of the projects that you're working on, your Patreon, your Facebook group, everything that you do, you've come such a long way. I would like to know how your journey has been from being that person who posted 50 pieces on your first day on DA <laughs> to where you're at now and kind of those past X years as you've grown as an artist. Uh, I think that's a really interesting journey that it's been because like on one hand things have really changed since then and I've changed my strategy completely on the other hand uh it all started on DeviantArt and I still notice that in my um you know strategy overall like in how I am you know present on other social media platforms DeviantArt was like the foundation the roots for me uh on DeviantArt I I just joined one day on Twitter, I, I posted my oldest journal entry, which is just me <laughs> saying like, um, I, I don't know what to do. I guess I'll try to figure this out. Probably that's on the same yeah. day that I uploaded all those drawings. <laughs> and I just started like, whenever I was done drawing, I would upload it. And then uh, I wouldn't worry about the time that I was uploading it or anything like that. It would just go up. Um, slowly, I started to build, you know, people who came and looked a lot of stuff I never got any comments or, or any favorites there was one drawing that I was super proud of of like Neo from the Matrix you may have noticed <laughs> that I was a Matrix fan um, and somebody was like you need to crop this better and I was like okay and I, I updated it and did a better crop and I was like do you like it now and I never got a response you know? <laughs> <laughs> that kind of stuff. I was just kind of like experimenting. And, um, and then I noticed like on DeviantArt, since a lot of the people who are on DeviantArt are themselves artists, I was getting a lot of people who are like, how did you draw this? You know, um, could you make a tutorial? Could you make a, a walkthrough? Give me tips, give me advice. And I was always like, no, like, because I'm self taught. So I was like, you mm -hmm. need to teach yourself. You know, I assumed that that's how it worked for everybody. And now, um, you know, way so I kind of like 
always kept my deviant art but my deviant art doesn't have the time pressure so on instagram or on twitter or mm -hmm. whatever it's important to post at a certain time when the most followers are online because otherwise people will simply not see it they'll miss the yeah. chance and on deviant art i was um i could always just post an update and um where was i going with this I had something really interesting to say about this. It'll come up. <laughs> oh yeah, so the knowledge sharing stuff, right? Yeah. I know that like, I, I always, I, I've tried to bring my DeviantArt followers with me on these new platforms. Cause I know that like a lot of people stay on DeviantArt but also go on Twitter, also go on Tumblr. Mm -hmm. And I was like, come with me, come with me, join me on these platforms too. And that, and I think that the fact that it all started on DeviantArt for me is the reason why knowledge sharing is completely foundational to my career and my online um, presence because I'm always trying to share tips, share advice, share my process. And now through Patreon, I'm actually monetizing that as well. And it's because it started on DeviantArt where most of my followers were other artists. And that is still yeah. a fact for me. So in my art books, I also write, I wrote my art book and I, I put information in there because I'm writing to other artists. And it's, it's just my fan base is mostly other artists. And that's because of DeviantArt. So yeah. That's what I really love about that whole story is like it, that my approach to posting times and the way that I interact has changed because I have to adapt to these different platforms, different algorithms. But the the sort of relationship style is still similar to how it was initially, which is like artists exchanging tips, exchanging knowledge, uh, relating to one another as artists. That, that's always one of my favorite things to see when we do like in-person events or deviant meets or whatever, you know, you want to call yeah. them now is yeah. hearing those conversations. And I mean, you can see them online, but it's different in person for sure, where you can really hear those conversations happening about art and about like the way that different things affect different people with art or how they can yeah. learn from each other's, uh, you know, histories and understandings. It's yeah. so cool. I think artists are, are really people who like we it's a stereotype that artists struggle. So we are more vocal about the fact that it is really rough to be an artist. Sometimes there are a lot of insecurities and like hard to make a living. You know, there's not like one template that always works. Mm -hmm. And and it, and I think artists are very welcoming community that they try to help each other out. I think that's really special about the artist community. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, I always enjoy it when I, whenever I like I spend a lot of time in newest that's one of my favorite things is scrolling through and I'll spend a couple hours a day going through trying to find stuff to put on social media and whenever I find a piece I'm so excited I'm, I always have this moment of like I'm gonna be the first one to see this piece and I'm mm -hmm. like discovering this and then I click on it and there's always like a comment that's like I love this and this and this about <laughs> like oh they, <laughs> they beat me too but they're so happy about finding it too like yeah yeah it, the art community and how Especially now I feel in these like, for lack of a better term, COVID times, I feel yeah. have been super supportive of each other and really uh, unifying in a way. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, it's been really kind of uh, interesting seeing how that has uh, shifted even the art community as a whole. But uh, let's see. I'm looking at my notes, <laughs> <laughs> seeing all the questions that are coming in. Thank you guys for leaving your questions. Please make sure to put them in the chat below. We've got producers running through pulling questions so that they can send it. I saw some people earlier putting their DeviantArt handles. I appreciate that. So I can go look at your art later. Um, but uh, we do have another question from uh, Pencil Cot that says, what was the moment you just knew you wanted to draw and paint as a career? Um, so I, I always thought that like making a living off of art was not possible because everybody who I grew up with told me that. Um, and it was just an assumption really. Um, but when I was, uh, in high school, I loved drawing so much. It was just like a deep, like need to draw. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. It was, it was just really, really intense. Like, and I was also a really diligent student in high school so I did uh, international baccalaureate which is like a super competitive program and I was like I'm gonna get the highest possible score even though I didn't need the highest possible score because I was going yeah. to a Dutch Dutch school and Dutch schools don't even care 
Like, it's really weird. We have a strange culture here. They don't really like look at your, well, they look at your grades if there's like a high degree of competition, but for the most part, they just want to know like, you know, did you pass? Oh, okay, mm-hmm. then it's fine. Um, but I really, really wanted to be super good at school. I felt the need to prove myself on an intellectual level. And I had like these two things in my life, you know, really intense studying and learning and trying to reach like a sort of, you know, Ivy League college degree of of academic skill. And then on the other hand, like wanting to draw. So I would like take these notes, history notes, study, 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 study. And mm-hmm. then when I was done, I would like draw like a back then I drew a lot of what they call anthros and I guess now they would call those furries um like half animal half people I would draw like anthros in the margins and I'd be like that was so satisfying I love that you know (laughs) and I would usually draw all night so I would like study until like 10 or 11 p.m and then I would just draw until like four in the morning Mm -hmm. barely ever got any sleep so it was kind of a, hard to fit those both in. It was it was very like two extremely competitive um, like urges that I had. And so I thought that I would study philosophy or anthropology, history, something like that. Mm-hmm. And then uh, and then I realized like I just one woke up one day and I was like, this is not manageable. It's just not possible for me to combine drawing with whatever academic pursuit I had in mind. Um, mm-hmm. And and I, I'm starting to feel like drawing is maybe more what I like to do. Cause I, so when I reached the, like when I did my IB exams, I was like, uh, I finally had time and I just wanted to draw all day, just all day. And I couldn't imagine having to go back to college and going back to academic stuff and not drawing all day anymore. So I talked to my art school teacher and I was like, what do I do? And he said, I have a friend that studies animation or or, I have a friend who is an animator. Uh, You could do animation. And I was like, okay, I'll do that. And literally that's all it took. I think the conversation was literally that short. I think he said- That's amazing. He said like, I know an animator. And I was like, animator, that sounds good. And then I just signed up to animation school. (laughs) It's amazing how those small conversations, like, you know, however small they may be to others can really define like a life, you know, Mm -hmm. like to have that one conversation at that perfect moment, really. I should actually tell him that because I still have Mr. Olson, my art teacher in my, uh, in my Facebook. So I think I need to like really tell him what an impact that one line had. Cause I just wanted to hear somebody say like, you don't have to become an artist. You can become mm-hmm. anything else. Like an animator sounded more like a job to me than artist. So yeah, yeah, it had a huge impact on me and basically shaped my life from there on forward. So I always knew that I wanted to draw, but I needed like that little push to encourage me to actually take that leap and let go of the stereotype that artists can't make a living. Yeah, uh, we actually have a question that came in from the audience really close to that of uh, from Anise UE that says, if I don't know what art path I want to follow, where should I start? So do you have any tips on like potential ways to narrow down artists to something that might be a little bit more focused or things that people can look out for? Yeah, It's hard because there's so many options nowadays and I feel like there's um, higher expectations on people. Like what I said earlier that young people are expected to have like a very defined skill set already. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'd say like when you do choose something, it's got to be something that you can spend a lot of time doing. And especially things like uh, becoming an animator. Like I learned from studying animation that animation is like a super high passion field, you know, where people in animation are like they live and they breathe animation, you know, and they make animation jokes and they watch animations all the time and they know about animation history. And I loved it, but I, you know, if you don't, if you're like on the fence about animation, then that becomes an insufferable life, right? So um, whatever uh, decision you take needs to lie close to your passion because otherwise you'll go crazy and you'll start to hate your classmates and later your colleagues. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So I I think for me personally, like I wouldn't have been able to follow uh, like a, a game, anything game related studies because I'm just not a gamer. So I would have been like out of the loop on all the jokes and all of the new games. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say what helped me, cause it's also very uh, local, like different uh, countries and different regions have different opportunities for 
certain industries. Mm -hmm. In the Netherlands, there's not really much of an animation industry. So most people who study animation end up doing something else, like with the skills that they learn from animation. Um, whereas if you live in LA, there's amazing opportunities for animators. So mm -hmm. I think you need to like look in your local area, um, go to schools if they have like open days and, and or talk to former students and let's get as much input as possible and try to get a sense of like what your future career will look like. Because school is relatively short but the career part will be your life. And those will be the people that you live with and talk to for a long time. So that's my, I'd say do a lot of research and get a sense of like what, what the opportunities are in your area and what helped me. I know this is becoming a really long answer. Um, no. but what, <laughs> we're, we're, we're I love giving you. advice. Yeah. Um, but what helped <laughs> me was uh, to think about all the skills that I learned as an animator and think about how those skills could be applied, not just to animation, but also to other fields. So as an animator, I also learned how to storyboard. I also learned how to make character designs. I learned mm -hmm. how to draw backgrounds, how to write a story, how to write a script, all those different skills. And I, the, that concept art skill ended up being my sort of path forward. But I didn't know that at the time. So I think when you do choose a direction and you're not totally sure where you want to go, try, choose something that gives you a wide range of skill sets so that you're flexible moving forward. Yeah. Let's see here. Other comments coming in. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, that one's pretty similar. We've, just for people in chat, we've seen a lot of things about how do I get started. And we've talked a little bit about that already. So make sure to watch this when we re-upload it. <laughs> um, I like this one uh, from Luca uh, 2002. It's any particular artist you think the world should know. Uh, I'm very much a fan of talking about like artists that I really enjoy and giving them a little bit of uh, highlight, but anyone that you've been following recently or that you really enjoy right now. Yeah. Um, if you don't know Eliza's art yet, E L E E Z A, mm. El Eliza, Eliza Ivanova, is her full name. She's truly one of the best artists I've ever encountered. And like, I saw her art and I thought like, this is some kind of art goddess who floats <laughs> through her house in a beautiful robe. But she, I met her in person and she was like, so nice and normal and laid back and chill. I was like, how does, how does that art come out of your mind? Like you're so normal. Um, <laughs> so she's like an awesome person and her art is beautiful. Um, and That's Andrew always Hatton, in always infuriating when it's someone yeah. talented and they're really yeah. nice. Yeah, they're just <laughs> nice, normal, casual, <laughs> laid back people. I'm like, oh. Um, and Andrew Hem is someone I always recommend. He's a painter who, uh, he has like kind of a street style of painting and mm -hmm. everything that he paints is like a dreamscape. It's like, it is like a dream and his use of color is really unique. And it's, I always, his, his the mood of, of his art is, always an inspiration to me what what things when you're when you're consuming art what things do you enjoy looking at and finding uh it depends like some i usually like the art that i love the most is art with a feeling that is like that allows my mind to wander mm -hmm. uh, so i love surreal art that's like a little bit unexpected it has some parts shown and some parts not like so that you feel it is the, so that it's like a dream you know mm -hmm. that certain things are in high detail and certain things are are vague and it, it creates poetry um but there's also a lot of art that i like because the form because i i really love three-dimensionality in art i love it when the shapes are like clear and sculpted and um so i i just love all sorts of character art that has that effect like that has some that you can picture it almost as a what do you call that as like a figurine or something yeah you know i, can I love that, that yeah. tactile quality to art. <laughs> yeah there's some amazing people that i've seen that use uh shading to really deliver that like tactile feel it's like a little yeah. bit of almost like film grain and yeah, you're just like, yeah. Oh, yeah, you can really get into it. Yeah, I love it when you can just picture it in front of you as if you could touch it. So that's mm -hmm. why I think VR could be very interesting for artists, because for me, that's like the kind of um, pleasure that I get out of looking at art is like imagining it, yeah. imagining being in it. And maybe that'll be possible one day 
uh, we, we worked with a company a few years back where they were doing VR art galleries. And it was yeah. very interesting to like go through and I did a tour of Drew Struzan's works. And yeah. it was very surreal to like be looking at the pieces in VR and you know, be able yeah. to get close and pull back and <laughs> see them from different angles. Yeah, and you also have Quill. You have like this drawing program that you can like draw in VR mm -hmm. and you can animate yeah. parts of it. It's so, so cool what's possible with it. Uh, the future when we're all in our pods. Yeah, when we're hooked <laughs> up to the matrix, unaware that our life fuel is being used for the robots. <laughs> hey, if, if they need it, they can have yeah, it. I, I yeah. just want to be able to fly around. Yeah. So I'm you're like that it. guy who takes the steak so that he can go back in the matrix, right? Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's it's uh, much cozier there. Ideally, yeah. I don't have to betray people to take that steak. But. Yeah, I think I would also take the steak in the nicest, most un like non-intrusive way possible to the team. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just going back, uh, looping everything around, uh, again, we're celebrating the 20th birthday for DeviantArt, which is why we've got all these balloons in the background, uh, precariously perched in my blinds and uh, blocking out my back patio. And we've got <laughs> Lois with us, which we're very excited about. And uh, again, there's a recreate this in your style challenge that we're running just kind of to celebrate. You get a cool llama badge at the 20 if you comment on it and submit your pieces. But uh, make sure to check out that link in bio to go take part of the DeviantArt 20th birthday. On social, one of the things that I've really been enjoying is I get to share art from all the years past. And it has been so fun seeing all the pieces I remember like growing up with you know start to appear as i go through that so that's been really fun too uh do you have any pieces that you recall back in the day quote unquote that you really enjoyed or were inspired by oh yeah i mean i think i got all my inspirations from deviant art early on um i mean also i was looking at some of the old art being shared on twitter mm -hmm. uh and i saw the pair with the yeah. smile um, <laughs> by uh, Ursula V, I think yeah. is her, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when I discovered her account, I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> I uh, remember that pair so well. <laughs> it, it, it was funny, yeah, the pair of Salamancia or something yeah, like that. She yeah. always had good backstory. I think she's still uh, like, still yeah. at it making these awesome yeah. stories it, it's been kind of fun it's almost like reconnecting with people that you went to high school with or yeah. junior high with because like i was going through and i was trying to tag them on you know the relevant social platforms that i was posting the pieces on uh to make sure that artists get credit where artists have art and um, and uh it was kind of fun seeing where everyone is now you know because there's uh, a lot of other sorts of updates that you put on other platforms outside of art and so it's kind yeah. of fun going back and seeing all of that. Um, yeah. And also like uh, kind of finding some history pieces of like Arvelis, uh, RJ Palmer. He had told a story about his, where his username came from and being able to actually see a piece of fan art made around this character he was making for a RPG that he wanted to design in high school was really kind of crazy. I was like, oh, oh this, is, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, a little bit anthropology cyber anthropology it's like history <laughs> it's, it's it very much is <laughs> um so let's see again a few last questions before we run out of time uh let's see uh uh how do you practice drawing while having a tight schedule is a little close to something we answered earlier but thank you for that question jada um do you, th okay, here's one that's interesting. Do you think that people who define their art style have less job opportunities uh, by Jenny Wallflower? So saying, um, if you define your art style too much and don't ex expand out, do you think that that can negatively impact a career? It really depends um, on like so many circumstances that are like both with, both inside and outside of your control. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of artists, like I, I do a lot of concept art for games, and I, I know a lot of artists who have an incredibly broad skill set, and um, they they can 
basically they're great for in-house artists because they like pick up all sorts of tasks that come their way and they're very flexible and they can adapt to other people's styles Mm -hmm. and for me I always thought that like being having quite a narrow style like a narrow easily identifiable style would hold me back I always braced myself for to hear that kind of feedback from my clients, you know, like, oh, yeah, we'd love to work with you, but you're not, you know, broad enough in your skill set. But it's never turned out to be a problem in my case. Um, and, and in actual fact, it, it, it became my strength as an artist because mm-hmm. I'm asked to work on the aspect of the production that needs my attention and the other stuff goes to other people who are experts at that. So I've always focused on uh, character design, mostly of female characters and other artists are doing like, you know, the big muscly male characters. Uh, I've drawn those and I can draw them, but I'm not the expert in that field, right? So then Mm -hmm. they get the expert to work on that stuff. And then there's experts in environment and experts in splash art and all of that. So I've always found like my niche. Uh, I think I think having an, a clearly identifiable style has worked well for me. Um, I, can, I I definitely can imagine that there are scenarios where it doesn't work so well um, for other artists, and it's good for them to branch out and have a wide skill set. It entirely depends on like your situation, um, your potential clients, like the field that you work in. So mm-hmm. I think that it's good to uh, keep, draw what you love. If you like to work in a narrow style, do it, you know, just, at, but learn how to potentially expand your style if that's asked of you. And if the feedback that you're getting from people is like, oh, this is way too narrow, um, you know, try to figure out ways to branch out. You have to be sensitive to how your artwork is being received. But I think it's mm-hmm. both things are possible and both things can allow you to thrive. Yeah. And uh, I think that's very true is like, it kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier is if you draw something that is your passion and that you have that like joy from, yeah, you're going to succeed with that. Like that's what people want that authenticity and get yeah. uh, engaged by that authenticity. Exactly. Because I was, I was watching a sort of like panel, an online panel of an online festival. And it was like all these, it was like a group of people together all saying like, yeah, why do people like, you know, draw in one style? It's so boring, so limiting. Like, I don't get that. Mm -hmm. And I was just watching it like, (laughs) I do that. (laughs) But that's, it doesn't inspire them, right? So for them to explore all sorts of different techniques, all sorts of different types of art works for them and ignites their passion. And for me, uh, working, drawing the female characters and staying within my style is soothing for me. It's calming. It's something that I love to do. So Mm -hmm. it it really is like it it has if it connects with your passion, then it will also send out the message to the world. This is my skill. This is where I thrive. And that's Mm -hmm. the best thing to be as an artist. And uh, one final question that I've seen a lot of people kind of hitting in the chat. Uh, So as someone who's spent a lot of time visible as an artist online, um, how do you deal with negative feedback that you receive? Um, Well, I've gotten, it depends entirely. Like some negative feedback is like truly just people who really, really don't like my work and are just like, I hate this. And then I always think like, that's fine. You know, everybody has a right to their own opinion. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a lot of art out there that I don't like. I wouldn't go after them and say it, but you know, I I really don't feel that anybody is obligated to enjoy what I make. Um, there's also people who give me like specific kind of feedback, like uh, you know, uh, the way that you. There was someone on DeviantArt who went through all of my drawings and was like, "The hands are literally the same on all of your art," <laughs> and I was like, "Oh no, he's right." <laughs> and then I started branching out. Uh, Ethan Becker also made a video making fun of the fact that I draw the hands all the same. He said that uh-huh. my technique is when in doughty, one finger outy, which like all of the hands are like like that. Yeah. One, one finger. <laughs> He's right. You know, that is a valid criticism. I get that. And sometimes the negative feedback allows me to be reminded of like Mm -hmm. getting stuck in certain patterns. Like sometimes people are like, well, lately you've been drawing all this kind of stuff or all that, or you make this mistake. And I'm like, it it stings, but they're right. 
Um, and then sometimes I get feedback that like shows that this person does not share my interests. So mm. um, like I've gotten feedback where somebody was like, I like how you draw, it has potential, but you need to draw more vehicles. You need to draw more machinery. You need to draw more monsters. And then I think like, it could be good for me to try different stuff, but I think that his area of interest is different than mine, you know, because yeah. I don't really, like, I think it'd be good to practice drawing more machinery, but I'm not interested in it. It's not like something that ignites my inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, and then I always think like it's well-intentioned, but it's, I'm just going to have to put that aside. Uh, and then there's like the downright cruel feedback. Like <laughs> I've had an art school where my art teachers are like, we never want to see this crap again. <laughs> and in that case, it's like really hard to deal with, especially if it's some kind of gatekeeper, like my art teachers, you know, who are like mm -hmm. gatekeeping my ability to pass school. Um, and in that case, like, I think, I think what I always tell people is really important to make a, dis a distinction between helpful feedback and like toxic, like mean feedback. You know, a lot of people have like friend group artists and then there's one artist in there who's like, I hate everything you draw, you know, and mm -hmm. it can get really intense. And, and I'm always like, there's certain people that will never get what you do. They will never support what you do. They fundamentally disagree with you and they don't like you. You really have to cut those people out. Um, and as an art student, you learn that like you have to constantly be getting that feedback and applying it. But I don't think that's true. I think that some feedback is not useful. And I used to think that all feedback was useful and I needed to be able to handle it. And now that I have a career, I look back on some of that feedback that I got and I just think like, wow, that, that's like the most epic waste of my time that I sp even thought about what that person said to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I guess my general rule is like, understand where the person's coming from figure out like whether they get you whether they appreciate what you do and admit defeat if you are like you know look objectively at your work and admit that sometimes the negative feedback might be justified don't take it too hard you know just roll with it and if people are bullying you just like my teachers did just you know move on in, in whatever way you can block them out yeah well thank you so much for your advice like i'm sure that so many people watching are finding it helpful and for joining us and for being with us for so many years of deviantarts 20 years yeah. like 17 uh, be, and counting be, being a massive part of my deviantart journey personally too which mm -hmm. has been surreal to be able to chat with you and get to know you uh so thank you so much for that and for being a part of the 20th birthday with the recreate this in your style challenge which everyone link in bio go check it out yes make something off of that because it's very exciting. Celebrate DeviantArt's 20th birthday with us. And I think that's going to do it for us before Instagram cuts us off. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you again for joining us. And yeah, goodbye, yeah. everyone. I appreciate you coming in.